Hey everyone, welcome back to D&J's Epic Quest. I am Jay Rule, also known as Justin, and joining alongside me here is... Derek. I guess I'll, I can stick with Derek Cronus for now until we get into House of Chains. That'll work. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking too, but <laughs> it is what it is. It's weird. It is. Like post Memories of Ice. Yeah, that book was a big part of our life for probably as, as long as we've had a book go in our short career so far. So it is a little weird to move on to something different. This novella is definitely a nice change of pace. The writing style, like the, the difference in it is, is very interesting. I remember like probably one of the first times we talked to Mora and Lee, Mora said we could read these kind of whenever they're just fun. And it really is. Well, I guess we say we're halfway through the book. Right. Um, it's weird. <laughs> pretty close anyways i mean near enough yeah um i don't know if i would say like the writing is different i mean i still like it's in the same same vein that same like subjective not really no what am i trying to write like subverting expectations a little bit like granted they're not on like a huge scale by any means but it's definitely yeah. kind of like smaller wins i guess you could say they're not like heavy staked it's uh, I mean, it's a lighter tone for sure. Yeah. I think. So that's a little, maybe a little different compared to what we're used to where I mean, we definitely had lighter moments, that humor and stuff. But this just kind of seems to be so far in this first half to kind of flow more lightheartedly, if that's a word. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely some of Erickson's iconic <laughs> humor, which I feel like is almost harder to detect in this one. There's some moment. I, I kind of feel differently, I guess. Mm. <laughs> um, to me, the whole thing's just kind of humorous. Just reads yeah. sarcastic or what? Uh, I don't know that I'd say sarcastic. Just it's, I feel like I can tell he was having fun with this. I mean, it definitely didn't have the serious tone. It's, I don't want to say it feels like it's a joke, but it, it feels like there's, it's just kind of constantly joking around with itself. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, so I guess we can move on to our patrons, right? Yeah, unless um, you wanted to maybe talk about what you're reading here now before we get into that, or we could do that after, whatever, you, whatever you're thinking. Yeah, I'm currently reading what's called God Killer. About halfway through it. I've enjoyed it so far. It's it's dark, um, but it's a little bit heavier than like the Redwall books, per se, per se, but definitely a lot grittier than the red wall book, but not as gritty as like Malzan by any means. So I'm comfortable reading it. So there's an elk on the cover. Is are the characters like animals then? Or no, no, characters are not. Just with, you're comparing it with red wall and stuff, so I wasn't sure. Eat I just meant cat. like as far as like <laughs> that, you know, the heaviness of the book. You know, it's sure. it's red wall is pretty light. You know, there's some like sadder moments in some things, but this is just like very like realistic you know basically there's gods literally in everything you can think of they've been outlawed but now they're coming back and there's like wild gods and new gods and old gods but the main character is a, a god killer right and so she basically kind of embarks upon this quest taking along a few strangers she meets along the way type of thing so yeah it, it's 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 definitely like there are definitely some gory parts, like things that maybe Redwall should be <laughs> as far as violence goes or could yeah. be. But yeah, it's it's pretty good so far. Cool. You look you, like you got you annoyed reading? there for a second. Uh, I am reading. I've got 
I'm reading Adjacent Monsters by Luke Tarzian. I'm only like 30 pages into it. Chapters are fairly short. I'm like four, four or five chapters into it and like 30 pages. But I'm really liking it a lot. It feels like I picked a good book for this time of year because it, it feels like a spooky read. Kind of hard to tell you too much about it since I'm so early in it. But dude, like that first chapter, it just hits you and it's like, what the fuck am I stepping into? Because this, I don't know if it's going to be a main character, I assume, because this character is showing up in a few of the chapters. But uh, they are dragging their significant other to a tree, hang them. What's this book called? Adjacent Monsters. Jason. So this, it's adjacent. Adjacent Monsters. Yeah, so it's, I, th- I believe there are two books within this book. So I think the first one's called The World Maker Parable. And I don't remember what the second one is. It's upstairs in my bedroom on my nightstand, so I can't grab it. But he's got green, this, uh, I don't know that it's like a sequel, but I think it's set in like the same world. Um, but it's called Vultures. The sequel to this is coming out later this year. So far, I'm liking Adjacent Monsters. I'm probably just going to roll right into Vultures after that. And then we'll see after that. Pretty confident he'll he'd be willing to have a chat once I finish okay. reading the other two. And then I, uh, as we went, flew to Detroit last weekend, I started reading Alien Phalanx, uh, which is like, I'm like 50 pages into that, which is uh, an alien novel set in a, like a, a medieval world. It's not our planet. Basically, so far, like the main character is like, I don't know, I think she's like a teenager, 18, 19, maybe 20 ish, somewhere in that age range. And uh, I think they call them runners, if I remember right. But they've got to like go to other holds and stuff to like trade supplies and bring letters and whatnot. And they don't like they have a they call it a hidey suit, which is just, you know, I imagine like a ghillie suit for like a sniper. Yeah. To hide them from the aliens. And then they have a knife, which isn't to use to try and hurt the alien. It's used to kill yourself if you get caught. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. So I'm I'm looking forward to progressing through both those books awesome on our patrons here in order of subscription yes. we've got jan the picker luciana intriguing ryan the topological damien the rock of faces nate fiddle me this shield anvil dylan calvin he who witnessed livia the malazan potato aaron mott irregular scott the only and grace graceless passion and then joining our little chain of dogs here we have Dead Smell. Welcome, Dead Smell. I don't, I don't remember if we got you in on the live stream or not. So. I think that they were still a part of the free child with them. Got you. Well, yeah. welcome to the first episode with your name being shouted out there. So, uh, definitely grateful to have you aboard here and, and add you to our list. Yeah, absolutely. Well, here it is: the first half of Blood Follows, the uh, tale of Boschelaine and Corval Brooch. Why don't you take it away here? Sure thing. Feels weird to do this. I guess before I start, I've been listening to the episodes you put out of our live stream, and I'm partway through the second one. And listening to it, I'm like, man, I really don't sound like excited in that or anything. So I just want you guys to know that I was. I don't know if it was just because I was at my parents' house. Maybe it sounded a little different. It was a long day. Secondly, um, but I was I was into it. I hope you know. Hopefully, you guys don't think I, like I wasn't about it. So, anyways. Just wanted to mention that. Maybe you not, might need to start acting with your voice. <laughs> well, I, I think I did a little bit. We'll see. Yeah, I'm definitely not. I'm not against it. I mean, I have fun when we do it. When you know, when we've done it with HC and even you know a little bit in the Miles and books, it's been a lot of fun. So, not definitely not opposed to it. All right. Well, uh, take your way, sir. The bells rang across the lamentable city of Mole, 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 Mole. I don't know what you said, Mole, Mole. The sounds echoed throughout the city, through the barrels, barrels older than the city itself that had been ripped apart in search of treasure, down into the depths holding rotted furs, stone weapons, and the occasional corpse of a hunting dog, and even more rarely, a horse with its head put at its ma- master's feet and a hole in its head. Few of the dead things answered the call of the bells, and just before dawn lifted, lifted themselves into the presence of someone or something. They would return to their holes in the earth because of those who saw them or knew anything of shades, knew that it was that it looked more like a flight away. Crowds had gathered outside the walls of Burns Temple to make amends over a sudden death 
and to thank the sleeping goddess who still slept. It was not uncommon to see a manservant exiting the side of Hood's temple, trying to bribe the Lord of Death, trying to buy another day. It was the monks of the Queen of Dreams for whom the bells tolled. There was murder the night before, and while the bells continued their harsh ring, in an alley behind a small estate of Low Merchant Way, a diviner of the Deck of Dragons puked up his breakfast of pomegranates, bread, and wine, surrounded by dogs, waiting their turn. I don't know about you, but I like loved this intro because it almost kind of like reminds me of those like panning in shots when a movie starts of all of these like different things that are happening. That that's kind of the imagery that came to my mind. Yeah, it it was one of those cinematic things. I liked a lot of the descriptions and I parsed it down quite a bit here. Just I think for our needs, I didn't need to include all of that. You know, there wasn't I think there was any uh dialogue or thoughts in this very first part just kind of setting the scene but really the only thought i had that i jotted down was just how gross he's puking up his breakfast and the dogs are just waiting to look it up <laughs> this is what i mean you know like what i was saying you know where it's just it's just kind of fun and that sounds weird to say uh you know with that kind of a description but it's just not taking itself super serious sure Maybe maybe that is the difference in perspectives. I mean, clearly he's a diviner of the deck, and I would imagine that something that he saw that was revealed through the deck of dragons uh, has made him unwell. I thought he was probably just drunk because he had wine. Maybe. It's possible. It could go both ways there. Did, uh, did we know that he was a diviner in Memories of Ice? Who? Well, I'm assuming that this is Emance Poor Reese. This is not a Mansaparis. You don't think so? No, oh, that's who I thought it was. I mean, that's kind of the way that it makes it seem. But I think that I think that that gets revealed in section three. Maybe we could talk about it then, and maybe that's just me not remembering his name. Opan or Ofen, Ofen Goal or Ofen. Oh, uh, no, didn't stole. this person start with an S? Yeah, yeah, stole, stole Ofen. So okay, I got you. I'm sure, I think it's him tossing up, tossing his cookies. Because in that section with gold, he's saying that, you know, hey, like, I read the deck of dragons and not good stuff. Hmm. All right. There's some things that kind of get tied in to this first section here throughout, uh, I guess, the first half of the book, you could call it. But uh, the monks of the Queen of Dreams are basically tolling the bells because, as we'll find out, someone kind of untimely passed away. There was a murder. Right. The only thing that I was curious about is just this whole, like, shade thing. I don't know, because it seems that the bells are causing the shades to, like, wake up or rise or stir, stir, stir around or whatever. So hopefully there's some answers uh, somewhere in this novella here. I kind of felt like there was, well, because, like, a shade's like a ghost, right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, so do like I, I guess I didn't think that they really slept or anything. There was there was that part where I don't remember who it was, but somebody said he he like talked. Maybe it was Gold. He talked to like the shades because like they're in the tower, and yeah. uh, he's like, "Hey, can you just like every once in a while, can you guys just like ooh make the spooky noises and stuff like that?" Yeah, yeah. I think I think that it's the uh, the presence of the killings and who's doing it. Is kind of why the shades seem to be uneasy, I guess, is for lack of a better term. You know, they seem spooked themselves. And, you know, from what we know about memories or from memories of ice about Bosch Lane and Corbel Brooch is that, uh, you know, they're necromancers. I would imagine that shades are probably not safe just as much as the living aren't safe. Which sounds weird because you're like, well, it's essentially a ghost. Like, what are you going to do? Die again? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah, you never know. I mean, we find out what what he can do with some of these souls. True, true, yeah. true. So, yeah, it was a cool intro section. Every time I read it, I really enjoyed it. So, I mean, I I enjoyed pretty much everything here. I think these these two episodes will probably go fairly quick. Yeah, I would say so too. I mean, I, I'll be honest. I was a little worried about the amount of talking points that one would have in a short story, but. I think that I had a fair amount, and while this will not be a nine and a half hour episode, by any means, thank God, right? I think I think there'll be enough information to feel comfortable with it. Agreed. 
But yeah, I'm ready to move on if you are. Yeah. All right. Section two or chapter two, it's kind of undefined. So we'll just stick with our format of sections. The door slammed behind Emancipor Reese. He stared down the hallway at a niche, a niche that was waist high. Inside housed a small al- altar of Sister Solil. From where he stood, he could see the broadsword of his youth mounted on the wall. His head fell as he stared at the weapon and felt his age. His wife had gone silent in the kitchen, the morning's porridge sitting on the counter, awaiting to be cleaned. He heard her call and asked if it was him who had entered the house. Reese hesitated and his thoughts swirled around, leaving her and their kids. He knew how to tie knots. He could find a ship and hightail it the fuck out of there. Emancipor sighed and replied back to his wife. She asked why he wasn't at work. He replied that he was now unemployed. She calls him an incompetent bastard and assumes that he's been fired. He screamed if she could not hear the fucking bells. They were silent for a time before she started to berate him about lazing around the house all day. He sighed and told Subly that he would go find a job. As he slammed the door, the last he heard was her request to find a good job for the sake of the children. As he walked, the bells were still ringing, and the familiar scent of the street hit him. He thought that it didn't smell any different than any other neighborhood they had lived in. Across the way, Sturge Weaver was outside of his shop, getting things ready. He knew that the nosy asshole had heard the conversation that took place between him and his wife. His wife would be finished with the dishes and would be out flapping her gums, seeking sympathy. He knew that he would need a new job by the day's end, or all the respect he'd earned in the last six months would vanish, and he would be known as Luckless Mancy again. And folks like Sturge would be casting wards of protection against him. A new job was all that mattered now. Never mind that a killer stalked the city each night. Mancy shivered at the thought of the bodies that were found. Never mind that Master Balto wouldn't need a coachman ever again. He was on his way to the pit of his ancestors. Mancy shook himself. He almost envied the merchant's final trip. At least it would bring silence, not of his wife, but of those fucking bells. So I guess one of the first things is just this, you know, when you kind of get described his house, the house is kind of described. It makes it seems, or the way the house is described kind of makes it seems that it's in badly need of repairs. So I thought that just kind of was a good way of setting the scene. Like obviously him and his wife are, are poor or maybe don't have as much money, you know, kind of just doing the daily grind. Right. Dilapidated is the word that comes to my mind. A what? Dilapidated. Dilapidated. Their house. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously there's no finances left over to, do the repairs right it's the food it's the kids needs it's all of these things i guess another thing that i thought was cool is just like these things that i guess are being introduced on a smaller scale like the altar of sister salil and i can't say that we've ran into that yet and if we have i just kind of wonder maybe who it is hopefully like this isn't the only instance we'll see of it yeah i don't recognize the name either I know he had like Poliel or Poliel or whatever the fuck. Right. Yeah. The famine goddess. Yeah. So now that I'm thinking about it, because I think somewhere later on it says it mentions the sisters. So I wonder if those are the two sisters. Ooh. And they just have si- similar, uh, you know, like sounds. Or maybe it's kind of like Opan, where like there's a bad luck and a good luck. There's yeah. a, there's famine, right? And then there's abundance, right? So maybe Salil is the sister of abundance and Polio is the sister of maybe, maybe that's a, that's a, I'm, I'm going to stick with it. I like that. (laughs) We also get kind of, uh, how old Mancy is at this point. And I'm assuming I'm pretty confident that this happens prior to memories of ice, obviously. Oh yeah. It has to reasons. Right. But it sounds like he's 70 years old at this point. 70 something. Yeah. Which makes him a bit older in Memories of Ice, or even dead, like we kind of speculated. I wonder if all these, like these novellas, take place like before the events of Memories of Ice, or well, no, they can't. I'd have to look at it again. I feel like the first three or four happen before Memories of Ice, and then the last three happen sometime after. 
Mm. I would assume that it would probably be pretty obvious when we get to those. Yeah. So the next two are kind of related, but I know that he talks a lot about his wife. Well, not a lot about his wife. And that's was kind of piqued our interest when we were going through Memories of Ice. Like, oh, obviously we could sense that there was maybe like some disdain for her. But this this kind of like, okay, now I understand all that. Yeah, she sounds like a peach. Mm-hmm, right. Especially because, like, she clearly doesn't put the whole bells together with him being unemployed. And maybe he could be a little bit more direct about that. Yeah, he's not unemployed because he's lazy. He's unemployed because his master died <laughs> or was killed. Yeah, not quite fun employed here yet, so. Right, yeah, exactly. So it's funny how he kind of like as he steps out after their like small spat and he's like, you know what? This doesn't really smell any different than any other neighborhood we lived in. And he states in there that his wife nearly sold her soul for the house they lived in, which makes me think that in the shape it is in was a stretch in what they could financially do. And that was kind of sad to me, you know, like I'm assuming that they bought it in Maybe it was in good shape, but like not the best shape. And it has since just gone downhill since then. They're kind of, uh, I guess the term we might use in our time, time would be house poor. Yeah. And then this whole like luckless Mancy thing kind of comes back where he's like having some anxiety about the lack of luck that he's had. And it sounds like the person across the street who overheard their spat went to the extent of casting like protection wards. It's kind of sad that he's like that unlucky and that people would go to such extreme extremes to like keep him away, you know? So you yeah, just get you this do like you do. downtrodden feeling about him. His home sucks. His wife sucks. He's not feeling the most confident. You know what I mean? Like, I would take anything at that point, too. Probably, yeah. Anything would be better than nothing. Yeah. So, um, outside of that, I don't really have any other comments. So, I'm ready to keep chooching if you are. Sure. Go find the monk at the end of the rope and wring his neck. The corporal, little more than a boy drowning in the attire and armor, could only look at a sergeant. Gold turned away and told him to get going now and listened as the boy's footsteps faded and watched as the rest of his unit forced themselves around the body in the barrel pit, keeping gawkers at a distance. He saw the diviner stumble from the next alley over, and while the king's magus wasn't a man of the streets, his clothes looked the part. Galt didn't like mages. Ulfin was nearly 60, but had the face of a toddler. Clearly alchemy at work, all in the, say, all in the name of vanity. Gold called to the mage, asking him if he was done with his reading. Stahl Olfen said he was, and that it wasn't the work of a demon. I think this auto-corrected. I think it was Skrull, or a Jorlig, but a man. Gold said he knew that already. The last street diviner had told them as much. The king gives him a tower for this garbage? Unbelievable. Olfen snapped back and asked if it was the command of the king that had brought him here. No. It wasn't. He was a court mage, and his work was more of a bureaucratic nature. Murder isn't his specialty. Gold said he had never heard of a number-crunching mage. Ofen called him a fool and said he dealt with more, more with the realm. This here was the sorcery of a madman. This got Gold's attention. Ofen said whoever it was was skilled and powerful in necromantic arts and cloaking his trail. Not even the rats saw anything, at least so far as they remembered. Reading rats' minds had become an art form in Mole. Warlocks, sending them deep below the city, though he thanked Hood for the rat hunters who would spit at the feet of the warlocks if their spit was the last water on Earth. Gold asked about pigeons. Ofen said they sleep at night, that, and he would do rats, but not pigeons. And besides, the killer apparently had a taste for the nobles. Gold said that was a stretch, a distant cousin of a distant cousin, a mid-level merchant with no heirs. Ofen said it was close enough as the king wanted results. He reminded Gold that his reputation was at stake. Gold only laughed. It had been 11 nights and 11 victims. No witnesses, and the whole city was scared. Things could get out of hand quick. He needed to find him and put him on a stake at the palace gate. 
at least he had a clue now that it was a sorcerer and these street mages were nervous it must be a powerful it must be a mage powerful enough to scare the average street mage into silence and even worse it was a necromancer silencing souls or sending them to hood before their blood was cold often said he would see gold in the morning gold shook saying he would make a mistake was he sure the killer was a man Ofen said, reasonably sure. Gold asked what the hell that meant. Ofen said it had the feel of a man, and that he must had made an effort to disguise it. Gold asked if it was poorly done, and if so, did that fit with what a mage, who could erase a rat's memory and silence souls? Ofen said no, that didn't make sense, and Gold told him to think harder on it. Ofen asked what he was supposed to tell the king. Gold thumbed his sword hilt. It had been years since he had last drawn the blade, and he wished he could do do so now. He watched as the crowd pressed his guards in closer, thinking it could have been any one of them who did the murdering. He recognized a witch with dolls at her belt. She had been at every murder scene, and he had questioned her six mornings ago. Gold told the mage to let the king know he had a list of suspects, and also to let King Seljur know that he had found his court mage marginally helpful and that he, or Gold, would require the help of the mage further. Ofen said, of course, at the king's command. Gold sighed at the thought of his list of suspects. He wondered how many mages were in Lamentable Mole. One hundred? Two hundred? How many had any real talents? How many came and went from the trader ships? Was it an outsider or a local who went bad? There were delvings in high sorcery that could twist even the calmest mind. Perhaps a shade had broken free from its barrel. He wondered if there was any deep construction lately and made a mental note to check with the flatteners, even though it didn't seem like a shade stopped. The bells rang wildly, then stopped. He remembered his order to the boy and wondered if he had taken it literally. Another fun section, a little bit longer. Yeah. Just, I mean, uh, go ahead. You kind of, yeah, I mean, you just, you get this like detective thing. And then, as we talked about in section one, I believe that it's Opfan or Open who was tossing his cookies. I think you're right. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. For whatever reason, I just thought it was Mancy at first because I feel like the story's going to circle around him quite a bit. Yeah. But Open, Op, whatever the fuck his name is, it's just he's he's got a literal baby face, which is kind of weird, you know? <laughs> but he's also like portly too. He was described as like, I don't know, as fat as Krupp, but like maybe nearing Krupp. So just imagine this like very heavy set man with a baby face. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, again, the, you know, Erickson's kind of like iconic humor, but like right. this in itself is like really dark, you know? Oh, yeah, years. for sure. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, people die every day right but it's probably pretty rare that you got 11 murders and 11 consecutive nights <laughs> right and then you know Ophan saying that he seems to be attacking the nobles and gold is like ah that seems like a stretch you know what i mean so it's just kind of like a. it's clearly at the beginning of like the investigations are starting to get more serious because 11 deaths 11 nights like yeah, I don't know. I mean, I would have thought after like three or four days, maybe you start getting a little more serious. <laughs> 11 to me seems like a stretch to finally, you know, be the breaking point where you're like, oh, uh, okay, maybe we should do something. <laughs> Try to figure out who's doing this. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I think it's just one of those things where like in normal circumstances, based on what Open says about Gold's reputation, is that he probably would have solved it already had it been kind of like the normal circumstances uh is kind of the, the sense that i get there so well i guess i mean it does say that he interrogated the witch with the barbie dolls hanging from her belt five or six nights ago so i guess i mean he has maybe he just did, i think we get the sense that he doesn't really have a lot of leads right yeah he doesn't get a lot of leads but also like it seems that at this point the king is getting involved because that's why the magus is there is to try to yeah because he it. hasn't figured it out yet yeah even though right. he's not entirely helpful because the information he gives him gold already knows so it's kind of like this like standstill so to speak yeah so he gets more clues yeah 
this line about the rat hunters who would spit at the feet of warlocks if their spit was the last water on earth. I just really liked that line. It was fun. It is fun. It's a good line. It is. And then I wonder about, you know, he's he's like, ah, I'll try to read a rat's mind, but a pigeon? Not doing it. I, d- I don't really know why. Like, pigeon's basically just a rat with wings anyways. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I have any. <laughs> that's weird. It's some Any revelations on that one either? That's uh, That's strange. It's just, I don't like birds. That's, you know what? It's because he knows they're not real. Right. Yeah. They're all installed with cameras and recording devices. Yeah. Even, even here. Yeah. Yeah. Jump, jump, jump. Um, the one thing that I pointed out is when they're kind of talking about Gold is saying like, how do you actually know it's a man? And Ophan's like, well, it seems like he made some type of effort to disguise it. And then Gold's like, mm, that's like really tacky. I would imagine that someone who can erase rats memories and silent souls so that we can't get like an undead eyewitness account right like i thought that was kind of clever um it's because in memories of ice we found out that corbel is eunuch Mm, i definitely would not have made that connection i did not remember that so nice pickup thanks dude that that's he didn't disguise anything it's just i'm sure as a eunuch sorcerer it's maybe of a different variety maybe I, I guess that's what he hasn't got that testosterone flowing through him. Right. <laughs> no, that's it makes sense. That's a good that's a really good pickup, man. I I totally would not have uh would not have connected those dots. Fair enough. Uh I think this was my last thought on this section. Um, but often, you know, he's gold is like, Oh yeah, you know, go tell the king that I've got a list of suspects and you've kind of been a little bit of help. Ofen's like, oh, yeah, I'll do that at the king's command. But I thought he wasn't there at the king's command, so it just seemed a little contradictory um, to make that statement at the end. He's saying that he would continue to... So you see how he says that gold would require the help of the mage further? Ofen is replying to that, like, yeah, of course, as the king would command. Uh, gotcha. Yeah. All right. I can live with that. Makes sense. The other thing, and I don't know if you caught this or not, but like it took me fucking forever to figure this out, is just this line at the end where he's just like, I wondered if he had taken the boy ser- or lit or taken his command literally. And I'm like, what is that a reference to? And like, I would go back and like, you know, read all of the things. But what I thought was uh, open, stole open, is actually the like lieutenant at the beginning of the section. And the lieutenant, because the bells stopped, and so Gold was telling him to go hang him, go hang the monk ringing the bells, and then the bells stopped at the end of this <laughs> section. And so he's just like, oh, I really hope he didn't take that seriously. I kind of had a similar thought, except I thought, because yeah, the, the first line of that section is go find the monk at the end of the rope and ring his neck. Yep. And I was like, why would you, I, th- I thought somebody was like, hanged so i'm like why would you wring somebody's neck who is already dead so i didn't really connect it at first and then when i got to the end i was like oh it's a dude pulling a rope ringing the bells <laughs> at <laughs> yeah. the end of a rope right yeah right no. so I, i'm sure i'm sure that's probably a purposeful play on words and it may be kind of like a little bit of a got you moment and it got me yeah i was like this just seems like it doesn't make sense are you gonna use it they're already dead but no but oh, yeah, that might be hanging now. Yeah, I don't know. right. I mean, that's the beauty of the subversion, you know. And like, while that is on a very smaller and less dramatic scale in this moment, it's still that subversion. It's like low stakes subversion. Yeah. But yeah, those are all my thoughts about about that particular section, or I guess yeah. your thoughts. <laughs> both our thoughts. We can bring right. both our thoughts. There's nothing wrong with that. Ooh, well, should we continue on? Yeah, we. Um, yeah. yeah. About halfway through. The morning smoke from the hearth inside of the front room of the savory bar reeked of fish. Nancy was sitting sitting with Craigie and Dully, who worked on loading and unloading ships. His usual disgust for the two diminished as he became interested in what they were conversing about. Dully explains that the king, Selger, has been wobbly on the throne, excuse me, ever since Stig fell to the jack or the sheck or heck, fell to the heck. A horde of savages. <laughs> and Heckin the king hex. Sorry. Right, fell to the heck. A horde of savages, and the king has been bellowing empty threats. Craigie told Dilly that the heck were more than just savages, 
They were a pantheon of spirits and demons. Not to mention that Stig fell in the span of a day and night due to the war chief. And this war chief might be something special. Dilly says that he wasn't interested in that, as from what he could tell, the yek or the heck were not good on the waters. They had managed to burn some of Stig's harbors, and if that bit of stupidity didn't cost the war chief his stripes, then those elders ain't really that smart. All Dilly was saying is that the king was wobbly enough to turn Lavin Table Mole into easy pickings. Craigie blames the, the, the nobles and the king for shackling the city. And on top of that, the priesthoods weren't helping with all their proclamations of doom. Dilly simply put that what they need is a king with some spine. Craigie counters that and gives an example of Mad Hilt, who had usurped the throne and now nobody can say anything because they were all dead. They argued for a few more beats before Dilly asked Mancy if he was looking for work again. The two dockmen grinned at Mancy and said that Reese had a run of Lad's luck with his employers. Craigie suggested that maybe Hood had chosen Reese as his herald. The Lord of Death picks his own, you know, and there is nothing that can be done about it. Dilly tells Reese that Craigie had a point and said that his first employer, Luxor, drowned in bed, lungs full of water, and a handprint over his mouth. Mancy explains that the Sergeant Gold had found it to be an assassination. Dilly leaned forward and asked Mancy about the next one. The cutter had said that the heart exploded, and the fellow was young enough to be Mancy's son. Mancy said that Septural was fat, and he should know. Craigie jumped in and said that it was now Merchant Baltar, Baltro, Baltro that had bit the dust. He had heard that someone had taken Baltro's guts and cut out of the tongue so his spirit couldn't talk. Craigie also heard that the king's own Magus was down there, sniffing around Sergeant Gull's heels. Mancy had was, Mancy's head was spinning and looked up to Craigie and questioned if the king's own had investigated the death. Dilly asked Mancy if he was nervous. They continued on to talk about Baltro and the events that occurred before Emancipor told them to shut up and defended Baltro and the man he was. Dully asked if they all wanted another round. Reese asked where Dully had gotten the coin to do so. Dully smiled and explained he had gotten the coin from disposing of the bodies. No rights, no honoring. The priests won't even touch the bodies, regardless of how much coin the, de the deceased family doles out beforehand. The two dockmen explained that they would dispose of the bodies on the strand to feed the crabs. Then they would trap the crabs and sell them. Mancy was disgusted at this, and Dilly reminds him that he had been drinking on that coin from these exploits. Mancy rubbed his face and explains that he was mourning. Dilly straightened and told Mancy that he had seen a wanted ad for a manservant on a post in the square. Mancy mulled on it for a moment, as Dilly and Craigie seemed to mock how his wife doesn't like him unemployed. He told him to pour him another round in Baltro's name, and then he'd go have a look. I feel like this section was kind of like confusing to me because obviously it's like the history of Maul and, you know, kind of like some of the events surrounding some things that had happened in the past. So I guess my best to understand it is that Stig must have been like a commander or first sword to the king or something. And I, I like how Stig was like a village or town or something. Sorry to interrupt your thought. Oh, there. no, yeah, you, you very well could be right then. Because I know towards the end, uh, Emancipore talks about how he did like the Stig run when he was on oh. the ship. Then there we go. Never mind. Yeah, then I would imagine that taking that out of context or putting that back in the correct context <laughs> is that the heck had um, taken Stig, which is a city, due to like some type of war chief. I like I like the heck. I don't know. Like when I read it, I just read it as Jack. Gotcha. Um, but I, I like heck. It's fun. Yeah, I guess uh, hard to say. There's no dramatis personae in here. So, uh, dude, it's you've uh, um, it's sticking with the heck because I like right. it. All right, we'll stick it. I mean, it makes sense to me anyway. The silent J. Yeah, but as far as like kind of Dully and Craigie's conversation here i almost kind of feel like i side with Dolly on this argument here and it sounds like the king doesn't really know what he's doing and maybe not being smart 
smarter than his foe, but it kind of seems like their foe really isn't that hard to outsmart. So that like really sets a precedent that the king doesn't know what he's doing. I couldn't imagine an incompetent ruler. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right especially in this world <laughs> one of the other thoughts that i had is just uh as they're kind of explaining these series of unfortunate events as far as emancipor reese's like previous employers is that uh like the lungs full of water and a handprint over his mouth and we haven't really i mean we've seen that before at the end of memories of ice with like the lungs oh full yeah of water yeah. so dude um I don't know if this is one of your points. Let me just make sure so I don't steal it from you. It doesn't look like it is. Did you catch that? I'm pretty sure we get the name of the Gray Mane. I didn't catch the name of the Gray Mane, but I did talk about Gray Mane. Or at least I thought I did. You had it. You you summarized it. Well, you didn't say Gray Mane, but Ma I'm pretty sure Mad Hilt was the Gray Mane. Is. Was. Oh, look at that. Look at you. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure in the book, Gray Mane was near that. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. Hmm. I guess I could be, I could stand to be corrected, but I, I felt like when I read it, I'm like, oh, that's the gray man's name. Or maybe like it's another nickname or something, you know, I don't know. Felt like it was an identifier. Right. I was just like, I was, that was probably, and I know that we'll get there when we get there, but I guess while we're talking about it, I was really surprised that we got that name in here. Yes, I was too. You know, because obviously I don't, I don't know where this corresponds with like Gardens of the Moon. You know, because, like, that's where we entered the series. I don't know if that's, like, before then. Like, is, you know, is Kellenved still in power at this point? Or is it, is it Surly? Yeah. It's you know what I mean? So, like, yeah. I guess the last thing that I had on this particular section was just the brutal description of the way Balto dies. It was just, I don't know. I just liked it. It was cool. Uh, a lot of, a lot of brutal, brutalness. Not, not nice ways to die. I mean, even... <laughs> You've got water in your lungs and somebody's got their hands over your mouth so you can't spit, you know, puke it up. You know? Yeah, it, it was brutal. I, I don't know. I'm guess I'm I'm curious about this, you know, luckless Mancy type of thing. So hopefully maybe in the next sixty pages that maybe gets touched on a little bit more. Yeah. You know? I guess we'll see. Yeah. I guess you know what maybe we should have said. I mean, I know we kinda of said it's we're about halfway through the book, but um we stopped at uh, the bottom of page 60 is where we stop. So. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's 57 oh. pages left. I think it goes to oh, 117. Man. It's going to be easy then. Shorter than this? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, you know what? It was really nice having fonts that was probably like 10 times bigger. That was in Memories of Ice. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely will say it made summering, summarizing like so Pretty much quick. easier. <laughs> but then yeah. when we get to House of Chains, it's the same font size. Yeah. What do you do? Keep rolling. Right. Well, you ready to keep going here? Let's do it. All right. The walk down to Fishmonger's Round told him he had drunk too much. He saw some straight lines, lines, multiple, but had a hard time following them. He closed his eyes and he had the spins. Somewhere within the depths of his fall was Subly, who always said she would follow him to Hood's Gate if his dying left her in debt. He told himself he couldn't die, and besides, it was only his drinking that made him feel this way. This way, he wasn't really dying. He needs a job. He has responsibilities. The sun had nearly set, and the shops were closing up. Mancy could feel the fishmonger's nervousness as night started to fall in lamentable mold. He had wondered why he wasn't scared. Must be the ale. He felt semi-invincible, but he figured if he got the job, then all bets were off. A guard watched him stumble to a reading post near the fountain of. Beru. Mancy told the guard he felt safe enough and waved him away, saying he was Hood's herald, then had to backtrack, saying it was only a joke. He found the expensive-looking paper on the reading post and thought the paper would outlast the post itself. He struggled to make out the words as drunk as he was. He leaned closer, squinting, and read the short message. Manservant required. Full-time. Travel involved. Wage to be negotiated, depending on experience. All at Sorrowman's Hotel. He knew the hotel was less, less than a block away and travel would be good. He would have coin for his wife and he would be out of the house and the kids would be in school. His arm slipped off the post and he fell to the ground. Looking up at the sky, he got up and said he was getting that job. He made his way to the hotel and found a doorman who told him to be on his way. Mancy said he had an appointment. Doorman said he didn't have one here. Mancy said he had the manservant's job. The doorman said he didn't think... 
he would have made it long based on how he looked and smelled, but at least he was here on time. Let him in. Once inside, he saw a bowl of white worms tinged pink with some animal's blood. Mansi couldn't hold his liquor and puked into the bowl. He composed himself, and a voice called to him, and once the scribe saw him, he jumped up and asked if Dalg had lost his mind and tried to shoo him out. Mansi said he was the new manservant wanted to know where his employer was before he got another job offer. The scribe said it was wisely done, and the only way he would show up to work for these two would be if he was drunk as well. He told Mansi he would probably be fired, even though it was his first night, but they were on the top floor, the best rooms in the house. The climb up the stairs seemed to sober Mansi's stomach, and he wondered if he had, in fact, been hired. The scribe opened the door and said their new manservant was here. Mansi met the cold gaze of the man before him, sending shivers down his back, but he did not flinch. And as he studied this man, so was he studied in return. Mansi cleared his throat and said, Most excellent, sir, and instantly thought he was too loud. He introduced himself and said he was an able manservant, coachman, and cook. When he was cut off, man said he was also drunk and that he had a broken nose. Mansi apologized, saying he was drunk out of grief and rain, blamed the broken nose on a post or maybe the cobblestones. He had suffered a great personal tragedy. Mansi was invited inside and asked if he had any references. Mansi said his wife of 31 years. The man clarified, asking for his previous employers. Mansi said the last three were all dead. Prior to that, he was a coxswain on the Sirim, Sirime, for 20 years, doing the Stig run down Bloodwalk Strait. The man asked about the captain, who Mansi said was also dead, 60 fathoms down. The man said it was an impressive resume. Mansi said they were all fine men. The man asked if he mourned these losses nightly. Mansi said no, only the day after, and the merchant Baltro was a fine man. The man asked if Baltro wasn't the most recent victim of the killer in town. Mansi said that was correct, and he was the last to see him alive. Well, other than the killer, of course. Man asked Mansi to sit, and he would explain his duties. Mansi said he had heard there was travel, and the man asked if that was an issue. Mansi said it was actually an incentive. The man asked if he could read and write. Mansi said yes, he could even read Melzan. The man asked if he meant Malazan. Mansi said no, Melzan. You know, the Empire. The man asked if he had problems working nights and sleeping days. Mansi said it was fine with him. The man said he would arrange travel, book passage, keep their clothes clean, and free of vermin. Mansi said that was fine and he could do other, th other things as well. The man said as far as pay went, Mansi interrupted him and said he was dirt cheap. The man continued saying he would deposit a yearly contract worth into a reputable money-holding agency and he could transfer money home. And while he was working, his needs would be met free of charge. A man asked if 1,200 standard silvers was acceptable. Mansi stumbled over his words a moment, and the man upped it to 1,500. Mansi immediately agreed and wanted to know where he signed the contract. When did he start? Mansi asked what he should call them. The man said his name was Bauchelaine, but Master would suit him fine. Mansi asked about the other man he traveled with. Bauchelaine said his was Corbel Brooch, but he would only answer to him. He doubted Corbel would have use for him. Bauchelaine said now that everything was out of the way, he wanted a steak, rare with dark wine, and he could place his order as well with the scribe downstairs. Mansi bowed and said, at once, master. While I don't really have a ton of comments for this longish section, I really liked it. Just like how he's drunk, he fucking falls, right? You know, just being a drunk. Not all of us remember what that's like, but for some of us, <laughs> we do. But yeah, and then he just kind of i don't know if it's like drunk courage right like he seems to be overly confident when he gets into this this bar right or this this inn hotel whatever yeah yeah, yeah you know and he's just like i already got the job you know just that like i guess drunk man's confidence you know i mean i think it that is the epitome of fake it till you make it <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure i didn't uh I didn't really have much here either, other than, yeah, this is, I guess, maybe not for the same character, but it's uh, Puke and Rally number two that we've seen. Right. Um, and initially, I thought it was the second one for Mansi, but no, oh, just his first. But yeah, <laughs> just like reading this, it it does give me a chuckle because just like <laughs> the way the obvious things are pointed out, like, you're drunk, your nose is broken. <laughs> like, <laughs> just gave yeah. me a chuckle. I was like, Oh yeah. Yeah. That, uh, you know, 
I got drunk because I was sad and uh, I hit my face on a post or maybe it was the ground. I don't really remember. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was it was good. It was some good humor. And even just the, uh, you know, like, okay, give me your references. Well, the last three are all dead. <laughs> I think for most people that would probably be throwing up some red flags, but I don't think so for Bauchelin and Corbel. He's going to fit right in. Right. And, you know, I mean, being that, uh, you know, I guess this is a thought that I had. Being that we know what Boschelain and Corbel Broach can do, it's not like they couldn't find his previous employers and ask him how fancy he is. You know what I mean? Like they have some type right. of craft with the dead. So who's to say they won't check back later? You know, like a little uh, background check, right? Maybe they will. Yeah, but yeah, I'm ready to move on if you all are. Yeah, you all. There's only two of us. Here, I know, right? I'm just so <laughs> used to having a group. <laughs> We're not far removed. Weak. All right. Gold stood atop the dead Sekaran's tower. He leaned over the parapet and watched for the lantern signal poles to be raised. Sekaran's tower was less than 10 years old, but it was removed. It was, it was rumored to be haunted. Gold admitted to himself that it was he that started those rumors as he had found a new purpose for the tower. From this central point of view, he could see his system of lantern signals in any section of Lamentable Mall. In the days where the Melzan Empire had first threatened the city-states of theft, High Fist Greymane was close to conquering the entire island before he himself was murdered by his own troops. Sekarand had come to Lamentable Mall. He called himself a sorcerer, and he had contract with King Seljur, to help defend the city. Thus the reason why this tower was constructed. What followed after that though was confusing to most, but to Gold, he understood more of the details than most. Sekaran had raid, raised liches to keep him company within the confines. The liches had either driven Sekarand mad or they outright killed him. Sekarand either flung himself or was shoved from the top or, from the top of the tower gold now stood on sergeant gold had used the tower for three years now he knew there were shades about all of whom had vowed their service to the one lone lich that lived underneath the tower's foundation then their nature to the lich was a mystery to gold gold had been the one who had asked the shades to moan and howl ever so often the sergeant stood unmoving until he felt a presence at his side he slowly turned to see a shade hovering next to him Gold sensed with some alarm that the shade was moments away from launching an attack. He thought to himself that one shove and off he would go, just like Sekarand. Gold saw that the figure was slumped and grumbling to itself. Gold asked the figure if it was pleased with the weather. The shade replied that an air to smoother sound and scent dulled the vision, yet it dances unseen. Gold asked then how, or asked how so. The Shade said that among the Warrens, the air dances bright, and his master, the Lich, has sent him there as a warning. Gold wonders at this and asks if the weather was created by sorcery. The Shade replies that a hunter stalks the night. Gold said that he knew this, but asked what else the Shade sensed about the stalker. The Shade reveals that his master has no desire to be among the hunted. Gold told the Shade there wasn't much he could do in the way of the Lich, but he wished him luck. The shade grumbled the word amusing before disappearing. Gold couldn't help but think that these shades in of themselves were amusing. He tells himself to keep thinking. He gets distracted by a train of thought and refocuses himself on trying to think of suspects. A short time after the fourth bell, post midnight, three wavering lights rose in panicked haste above the dark buildings. He thought to himself that maybe Ophan had been right as the beacons rose from the estate district of the nobility. He spun from the Merlone and went for the trap door. He opened the door and dropped down. The shades set up a howl all the way down, and this time Gold knew their moans had nothing to do with keeping thieves away. I just, I paged through the book to find Mad Hilt's name. And I don't, I guess I'm not sure why I, I thought Greymane was in there because it wasn't in that part. So, oh, weird. Yeah. Um, yeah, Anyways, I guess, sorry. I don't know. But I mean, yeah, like I know we talked about Greymane. It was a name that was brought up, Memories of Ice. And although it kind of seems like he's dead here, 
murdered by his own troops. Jan had said during the live stream that we would get to know him. So I'm wondering if he comes back in some way, shape or form or what's going on there. Well, I thought like in the description we got of him, it said he had like a thousand deaths or something. No, well, that was the, read his advice. That was the bringer of Midnight Tides. Oh, okay. But I thought that Grey Mane was the Midnight Tides guy. And Jan said that I was wrong. Gotcha. So yeah, I mean, I'm not sure where I was drawing connections thinking Matt Hill was Grey Mane. Yeah. I mean, it's all, it's all good. Yeah. I mean, obviously there's history here. I don't really quite, I, I mean, I get it. You know, it, it is what it is, but I, I don't know if I can really, like, pick it apart and understand the connections further. Maybe I will as I continue to read on, and maybe some of this is brought back. I think that would be kind of cool if there's, like, a small conversation that, like, you know, either Picker or Blend are having with each other about, like, Grey Mane, or he himself has a conversation. You know what I mean? Like, it would be kind of cool to be able to be all like oh yeah we read that in that one thing but you know <laughs> right uh liches i had no idea what this actually meant and i know that like this word has been brought up many times and i always just thought it was like a like a form of shrubbery or something but it didn't quite make sense in this sense or in this maybe i'm thinking of lynches maybe maybe that's what i'm thinking of instead of liches it's an undead sorcerer that seeks to defy death. It's, I guess, like a character from Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, I, I think there was, was it a Warcraft game? There was like an expansion, like Rise of the Lich King or something. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, under this tower that Gold is sitting on is, it seems to be a remaining Lich who is kind of like controlling these shades, right? They have some type of unknown uh, loyalty to it. And then kind of when the shade and, you know, gold are talking about uh, the weather gold at wonders and asks the shade that was standing next to him. If the weather was created by sorcery, the shade was talking about the air earlier, how it like smothered sound and like, like muffled scent and like dulled your vision. It kind of gives me the sense that the weather is definitely sorcerous. I did not think of that, which makes sense, right? Like yeah, I just didn't think of it. Oh, okay, no worries. This That's why I, I like hear, hearing your stuff. I don't suck all the time. <laughs> the last thing that I had for this section was just I just loved you know how like the beginning and the end kind of tie in together, and I know that's I wouldn't say a reoccurring theme, but it's something that's used fairly often with Mister Erickson. You know, he's standing on top of this tower, right? Because he's got a good advantage point. He's basically set up this network of like signals right and so now he is seeing three signals kind of going up kind of detecting activity that i think we get in these next three sections i like yeah it's been this mystery stuff's been kind of fun it's like a uh malzan sherlock holmes or something yeah with some comedy enthroned in there right but yeah man i'm ready to go if you are all right just an hour before dawn, Bauchelain told Mansi to get his bed ready. They hadn't seen Corbel, but Bauchelain didn't seem to care. Bauchelain had spent the night hunched over his desk, scribbling sigils and signs onto slate. Mansi was exhausted and spent time looking around the room. He found some chain armor that he repaired and oiled. It had known battle as well as the man who wore it. Mansi had often looked at his master from the corner of his eye and found it hard to believe that he had been a soldier. He seemed more like an artist alchemist, or even a sorcerer. Nancy thought it was an odd way to spend the night. He finished the mail coat and hung it back up and found a flat box, taking it down and checked to see if his master was watching, which he was not. Nancy opened it and found a disassembled crossbow and a dozen iron shod quarrels and a pair of gauntlets open at the palm and fingertips. Nancy's memory took him back to a battlefield that would become legend. Estbanor's grief, where the militias of theft before each city had its own king, they had thrown an invading army from Corel. The soldiers of the Coral re regions carried Melzan weapons better than anything made locally. The weapon was made by a master smith made out of tempered iron, or maybe even the fabled De Ovorian, De Ovorian, some fancy steel. steel. Bauchelain told him to watch the heads of the bolts. They kill at the touch if blood is drawn. Mansi asked if it was poison. Bauchelain said he had been called many things in his day, but a poisoner was not one of them. They are, 
invested. Nancy said he was a sorcerer then. Balshlane said many people called themselves that. He asked if Mansi if he followed a he asked Mansi if he followed a god. Mansi said his wife swore to them, or rather she prayed to a few of them. Mansi said that the devout die too. He had prayed a few times. Maybe it had saved his life, or maybe not. Balshlane said he saw a long life in him. The face of death was distant. Mansi asked if he could see the moment of his death. Bauschlein said, as near as one could, but some veils are not easily torn aside. But he thought he had enough. And as far as the crossbow, it didn't need to be cleaned, so he could put it back. Mansi figured he was not just a sorcerer, but a necromancer. He asked Bauschlein if he truly saw his death, and he said yes. Mansi asked if he had a face of death, and Bauschlein appeared to die laughing. I don't know if that's a very comforting thought. <laughs> no, it's not comforting at all. But, I mean, I feel like if you were to be gifted that knowledge, I mean, it kind of narrows things down for you a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah, but then I, I think for me, I would be, like, paranoid. Because like, I think most people would think, like, oh, okay, well, I'm not going to die in a battle. But then I would think, like, what if I was in a battle? And, like, what if you just get, like, overcome with, like, a bloodlust? And you're just, like, you know, you're just killing people left and right. And then you're, like, laughing and somebody cuts your head off or stabs you or whatever, you know? Like... I don't know. I don't like to me. I kind of wonder, like, maybe it doesn't really narrow things down. I don't know. I mean, I feel like it is his age. I doubt he's going to be going running into battles. True. Probably not. Not in his age. But no. that's like what I mean. Like, for me, like, that's the type of shit I would. Fair. Yeah. Though uh, we are not 70 yet. We're no. more than halfway there. Shh. We don't think about that. Maybe we'll be done with all this miles and stuff by the time we're 70. Yeah. If we're still going at 70 years old. You're probably going to have to get a new co op. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope that, like, I could get through this before I die at least twice. I'd like to go and back through and just read it casually, maybe do an episode or two, like, post book read. I don't know if I have a ton. It, you know, it just it seems like busy work in this particular yeah. section. You know, I mean, obviously, there's that awkwardness. You know, he's been up probably for 24 hours now. And he was drunk for a good portion of it. Now he's like sober. He's, I don't know. Like he's probably not hung over, but he probably doesn't feel good. Right. Yeah. You know, and then he's, you know, given some, some news that is a little unsettling. I've seen your death. Right. But yeah, I don't, I don't have anything else to, to really comment on that. No, I, we probably take, this is your last section. I think you're right. This is my last section. All right. Let's go we're for it. Only, we're only an hour and 24 minutes in. This feels like really soon, but this is probably like still even longer than most average podcasts. <laughs> yeah. All right. Last section for me. Uh, Mansi was walking down the empty streets, muttering to himself about how Bosch Lane had told him about how he would die laughing. He contemplates quitting his new gig and kind of wonders what he's gotten himself into. He tells himself that if it's the lads, it's the lad of luck for sure. He was drunk too drunk to know for sure, and now it was too late. If he quits, his new masters would send something after him. A ghoul, a knit prill, or some other demon. His thoughts continued to those along the lines of like what his family would do after he was gone. He stopped suddenly as he bumped into someone. He stepped back in alarm as the man he bumped into was the size of half-blood Trell. He excuses himself to the stranger the stranger raised his arm, and Reist felt a, a crackle and something tugging hard at his guts. The stranger's hand came down, and the man giggled underneath his hood. The stranger is heard saying, Sweet fate, he's marked for me. Reist didn't understand, but realized that he wasn't in, he, or that he was in the estate district. Reese tells the man that he'll be on his way, slightly sidestepping to move past. The man giggled and is heard saying, Such a mark, saving. You felt a chill then. Reese thought this accent was strange and told the giggling man that it was too hot out to feel chills. The stranger then let him go, and as he walked, he felt cold eyes on his back. A moment later, he was surprised to see a cloaked figure hurrying down the street. Then he was startled by the running of, a, of an armored man, hot along the cloaked figure's trail. He thought to himself that it was likely a woman being chased as the cloaked figure was smaller. The sun wasn't even up yet, and he was suddenly tired, and up ahead was a commotion of some kind. 
He saw lantern lights, shouting, and finally a woman's scream. He hesitated but decided to go around the scene and get back to familiar ground. Reese felt gross underneath his clothes, as if he'd just been brushed by something unpleasant. He shook himself and said that he better get used to it, as he would be working nights a lot more. He told himself that he was safe enough, and he wouldn't be laughing anytime soon. You think that this half-blooded trail is Mapo? No, I think it's Corvo. Like he just, like he uh, glamored himself or something? No, I think that Bosch has marked uh, Reese as their new man manservant. So Corvo hasn't been there. He hasn't met him yet. So I'm thinking that this like this really like not understandable sweet fate he's marked for me and such a mark saving you felt a chill then. I think that's Corbel understanding, oh, I shouldn't kill this person because they're my new manservant. Gotcha. I just yeah. felt like it was weird to use that comparison, like a half blooded trail. Like are they common? No. That's all. That's what oh. That actually reminds me. I know in the first section, I don't know if you you summarized it. It was something about like nameless barrows, and it reminded me of the nameless ones from Dead House Gates. And then we also have this like trell thing. So I'm wondering if maybe the nameless ones existed on this continent as well. Maybe I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure I didn't summarize that. It's not ringing any bells. Yeah. Well, I think that they're because uh, like I know that I was trying to find where thief was on the malazan map it looks like it's on the so like if you have you know malazan or mal malaz it's on a continent that is like directly southwest of malaz i don't think it's like stratum or like the fist continent or some shit like that i forget what it's called but it's just basically a continent full of like islands. where were you looking at that uh online there's like oh, a map okay, not in one of the books yeah gotcha yeah, so we're we're on a completely different like continent that we haven't been a part of before. Sure. That okay. we haven't seen before. I thought it was a little sad because it doesn't he doesn't gather or get the sense, or I don't get the sense that Nancy has kind of any confidence that his family would miss him after he's gone. It's just and you know, he kind of alludes to this a little bit, you know, when in that kind of like interview, so to speak, with Boshalain. That if he were to end up dead, Subly would be so pissed off because he would leave her in so much debt. Yeah, I think she just don't want to work. <laughs> right. Lazy ass. I know, right? Who's the lazy one here? But also, this whole, like, you know, girl being chased by an armored man. I'm I'm assuming that's Corbel, right? Like, that has to be Corbel yeah. chasing, chasing the woman. I mean, they are in the estate district. I didn't, uh, I didn't, like, put things together that... Like, this is what comes right after, or this is like what precedes my last section. Um, it was just kind of as you were reading it, I'm like, oh, okay, this is making more sense now. Yeah. Um, so, and, yeah, it must be. Yeah. And also, I I just have a hard time, like, imagining Corbel as giggly. You know what I mean? Like, he, he seems to be giggling a lot. And I don't know if it's like a comic giggle or if it's like a sadistic giggle. I'm going to go sadistic because he seems like a goofy fucker, you know, like, yeah. And then the last thing, which, you know, kind of happened again is the last sentence kind of ties in the first sentence and even the land, you know, the end of the last section is just like, Hey, I'm safe enough because I won't be laughing anytime soon. Hopefully. Well, I don't know. I mean, you never know. Right. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I guess current events. Yeah. He's probably not laughing anytime soon, but. Yeah, I mean, he, he seems to be regretting his drunken decision a little bit, but I think he's kind of just decided to go with the flow at this point. Well, we've all made bad decisions while drinking, so that's not the first time, not the last time. Right. But yeah, those were all the thoughts that I had on that last section. All right. Well, should we wrap this up here? Let's wrap her up. All right. The guard said it was a messy one, and that, and Gold thought it was the worst one he had seen yet. It was young Lordson Hulm, ninth removed from the throne's own blood, and had died ignobly, ignobly, with his guts strewn about the alley. Somehow, no one had heard anything, even though he was found before his blood was cold. He had sent out tracking dogs and two messages, one to the king and the other to Magus Stoll Ofen. Besides Gold Squad, the lone horse still hitched to the overturned wagon, there had been only one other person present. Princess Sharn, King Seljur's only child and heir, 
and apparently a piece of work herself. He knew it would cause problems later, but he insisted on detaining her as it had been her screaming that had drawn the patrol. She needed to answer some questions, namely, what the hell was she doing out at 4 a.m. with no guard, not even a handmaiden? Gold said he was impressed with her calmness, and that meant he could question her while things were still fresh in her mind. She said he was presumptuous, which Gold ignored. He continued saying it was clear that she was in some sort of relationship with whom? With whom? That's funny. He needed to know exactly what she saw, smelled, and heard. Whom he, she said, was like this when she found him. He remarked on her nickname for whom. And where was her handmaid? She must have been the messenger, and he figured the love notes must have been fast and furious. He wanted answers. Magus stole open, showed up, and said not to answer any questions, and that the king wanted to see her immediately, that the sergeant was done with her. Gold said he assumed that whom wasn't an appropriate romp for the princess, and the king wouldn't want this known to anyone. So, if he ever interrupted his investigation again, he'd feed him to the crabs. Ofen tried to use the king's command as an excuse, and Gold shut him down, saying he was only one man. The king's fear is nothing compared to a city full of fear. If he were here right now, he would question him just the same. If he wants to have anything left to rule, to stay out of his way and let him do his job. Couldn't he feel the panic? Ofen said he most definitely could feel it, and he shared in it. Gold told him to take a good look at the scene. This was all managed in silence. Nobody in either estate on either side of the road woke. Who did this? Ofen said it was a silent spell. The boy screamed, but the air itself was closed, like it was folded in on itself. I sorcery. Gold asked about the carriage as it looked like it had been hit by a bull. Ofen placed his hand on it, on the horse, and said it had been driven mad. Its heart still raced, but it couldn't move. It will be dead soon. Gold was only interested in what it saw. Ofen said its memory had been wiped clean. They both turned at the sound of another approaching. It was the mortal sword. In a raspy voice, he said, Foulest of deeds. Apparently, an assassin tried to kill him a dozen years back, and Tolgord Vice, mortal sword of the sisters, survived, and the assassin didn't. Gold said he appreciated the help, but this wasn't a religious matter. The mortal sword asked if he could smell the stench of hood in this, and asked Open if he could deny his word. Open stuttered and said it was a necromancer for sure, but that didn't mean they worshipped the god of death. All priesthoods disavowed necromancy. The dark arts are an insult to the worn of the dead. A mortal sword called Ofen a coward. Gold said death was not the goal here, and hasn't been. Killer is collecting arts. The mortal sword questioned this. Gold specified and said organs, those vital for life. Removing them resulted in death. The mortal sword asked, why then were the souls destroyed? Ofen said it might be theft, which would be more difficult. The mortal, sword, the mortal sword asked why steal them if destruction was easier. Ofen didn't have an answer. The mortal sword settled into a saddle and told Gold not to impede him. His sword would deliver justice. Gold said it would be better if he, or the mortal sword, stayed out of his way. The mortal sword half drew his sword before Ofen could stop him and asked him to look about. He looked around. He hadn't heard the crossbows locking onto him, and Gold Squad didn't look like they were screwing around. Gold said this had been the twelfth night, and now it had become a personal issue to his men. He did not seek to insult the mortal sword or his honor, but if he drew his weapon again, he would be put down like a rabid dog. Mortal sword, he mocked the gods, and that his soul would pay, riding off. The carriage horse also dropped dead, shot by the crossbows. Oven said the killer was a foreigner. No one... No one in lamentable mole ranks this high in necromancy, not even himself. Ofen said he would report that to the king and that the list of suspects had narrowed. Also, he thought he was close to the suspect. Gold hoped he was right. He singled out a guard and asked if the death's her if death's herald has crossed his path. The man didn't know what he meant. Gold said he saw how he reacted to the mortal sword word mortal sword's word, but he meant someone else. For that role since its claim it's a claim he had made for the last 20 years but what did he hear in those words the guard said he only heard superstition a drunk in the warp district had called himself that earlier in the night gold asked what the man was doing and the guard said reading a post a posted notice in fishmonger's round he thought it was still there as it was warded or so he had heard gold said 
Once he reported to the king, they would check it out. The man with the dogs returned, saying it was a mess. They had found a man, or a woman's trail, or both, or neither, somewhere between one and three of them, but the dogs didn't like the scent, so they danced away. Gold wanted to know where the trail went. They lost it in the wharfs. Other smells to compete with, or the trails were magicked. All the dogs closed in on a sack of rotting fish, which was not like them. Gold said from the smell of them, they did more than just close in on the sack. The dogger said he thought they might be better off trying to hide their scent. Apparently, it wasn't just the dogs that rolled in the, in the decaying fish. So, yes, gross. But after your comment from earlier, part of this makes more sense to me now. Where is it? Like, yeah, it was a man or a woman or both or neither. I think it makes a lot of sense. Well, I think I think going. I don't. I recant my statement after hearing you summarize it and just talking you know just reading it out loud um i don't think it was corporal that mance first saw i think it was whom chasing the princess like they were about or ready he died. yeah right like they were about ready to i don't i don't i wouldn't say like it, it was an argument i think it was just like a like a lustful playful thing you know we're like oh sure you know what i mean they're she's running away to like hey, we're gonna have sex you know that type of thing <laughs> and he's just you know following ask me about my wiener <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> ask me about my wiener <laughs> glad i could work that in not yeah. that i planned to but yeah i don't think i really had let's see i maybe had one or two uh oh yeah the mortal sword of the sisters so yeah do you think this is uh what's her name soliel soliel and and oliel or whatever i think so maybe uh, yeah well, maybe somebody can confirm or deny that for us tell us we're wrong or or give us a pat on the back tell us to raffo which yeah almost kind of simultaneously aligns with a pat on the back i'd say yes. like seven out of ten times it's usually like a good indication that you're in the right direction. Yeah. I liked, I did like where gold is like, dude, can't you feel the panic? And Ophren's like, yeah, I share in it. Um, this is getting out of control. I, I don't know. I just like that. Um, I thought that was cool. I don't remember exactly what part it was, but I just like, you know, her, the princess's boyfriend is whom, whom are you? You know, that it just kind of clicked in my head. I'm like, oh, I mean, he's probably basically nobody. Right. Right. So I thought that was funny, and it just popped in my head as I read it all out. So yeah, I mean, it sounds like the king doesn't really want it getting out that she's messing around with someone who's maybe not royalty, or maybe not another noble or a lesser noble. You know? Yeah, he like go because he was so far removed or whatever. Yeah, you know, something like that. I mean, it kind of seems like gold is got a lead here, and up until that point, you kind of get a sense of the desperation you know, from gold, because it's like, oh my god, okay, this is the 12th one. Everything that you're already telling me is shit that I already know, you know, until he starts talking about, like, the Death's Herald stuff, and that one guard is like, oh, yeah, I heard some crazy drunk talking about that, you know, and so, it, you know, it seems like there's a lead. Gold doesn't know. Yeah, but. I think, I don't think I summarized it, but, yeah, you know, they're like, he, the, uh, you know, this killer is a foreigner, well, I guess I maybe kind of partially did because he's like, well, nobody, nobody in the city is this strong in necromancy, so it's it's a foreign, right? Because the city doesn't practice necromantic arts, so right, yeah. I mean, it does narrow it down, but it doesn't at the same time. Excuse me, right? Yeah, because you still got to know who's a foreigner, and I don't know how good they are keeping records who's in the city and who's not, where they came from, and all that type of thing. So, right, yeah. I don't know. I thought it was, I thought it was good. I mean, I'm not, I'm enjoying the, like, as we said in the beginning, I'm enjoying the, like the freshness of it because like, it's not as high staked, but like, it's still like really cool. I mean, there's the lore, you know, there's the subversion granted smaller scale, but yeah, I, I just, it's like, it's like a tiny Malazan is, is really what it is. It was cool to get into after reading three really deep and heavy books. Yeah, yeah, it's nice to have a little uh, reprieve, a little bit. Yeah, well, as far as predictions go, I kind of feel like Gold will catch on to the trail, so to speak, and spook the necromancers, and they're, they'll leave. 
is yeah. kind of where, where I see this going next. Obviously, there's you know things that are going to happen in between. I would imagine more deaths, maybe a confrontation, and then an exit. I don't know if I think Gold will like meet with them face to face and be like you guys need to get out of town. Because of, like like what is he going to do? Like you want to be a fucking number fifteen here, pal? You're coming up. <laughs> you just right. got yourself on the list. Yeah. So yeah, I guess we'll see. But yeah, it's kind of nice to. Well, it's probably the quickest we've ever summarized half a book in our life, but I would say so. I mean, and I mean, you know, I see that the the timer here is about an hour and forty six. So I would imagine that after edit, it'll probably be a little over an hour and a half. Which, yeah. you know, is as sad as it is to say on the shorter side of our episodes. It still it still feels like it takes nothing to do it. Yeah, yeah, I went fast. So I'll, I'm, I'm probably not going to read it tonight. I'm gonna. It's eight forty five, and I'm fucking just exhausted for some reason. I didn't do anything today, but I'm tired, so I'm probably just going to go to bed. <laughs> no, I mean that makes sense. I'm, I'm. I left my book at at work, so when I have some downtime, I will, I will read on. But I mean, it's weird to think that next week we'll be wrapping up Blood Follows and then moving on to House of Chains. Yeah, we'll have to t- talk about that because I know Malazan Brotherhood dudes. I know, pretty sure he's going to be gone the week of the 20th. Then I'm going to be gone like the following week, Wednesday on. So, I, I mean, I'm sure we'll get to read it before then, but I don't know. Maybe we won't be able to record that until like the beginning of November, that first full week or something. I don't know. We'll have to figure it out and see what lines up. Well, then maybe what I'll do is. Okay, so I'll release. So if I release the Romulus episode this week, and then I'll release the Redwall one next week, and then we'll be Corporal or the Blood Follows episode. You still have my interview with Mike that's Roberti, right. also. That's right. So I could do. I could do. Uh, I love that we have this fucking bank. <laughs> it really comes in clutch for these like these periods. Yeah, so this week I'll do Romulus. Next week I'll do Redwall. Then the week after that I'll do Blood Follows or this episode. And then the end, the last week in October I'll do your Mike Roberti one. And then that will get, and then I'll release, I'll release the end of Blood Follows the second week of November. So I would imagine we should be able to get, hopefully, sometime before the week of the 15th, we can record. Because you said the 20th of October. I'm pretty sure Brotherhood, Malzan Brotherhood guy, he was going to be gone. I think he said the week of October 20th. I don't know what what time frame exactly, but then I'm, I'm gone the 30th and I'll be back on the 3rd of November. Okay. Yeah. I mean, as long as, I mean, if we can record House of Chains that week, then I think we should be okay. Like the week of the 3rd? Yeah. I would think that will probably work. I'll I'll message those guys and see if that'll work for them then. Sweet. All right, man. Well, get some sleep. Yeah, it was fun to get back into this. It was, and it'll feel weird wrapping up the book in two episodes. <laughs> yes, for sure. It It's like our alien Vasquez, but more betterly and efficiently planned. <laughs> yeah. Hey, anyway, I mean, we kind of know what we're doing now, so. Yeah, but also that book was, what, 300 pages? Yeah. Something like that. It might have even been four. I don't know if it was 400, 350. I don't know. We bit off more than we could probably chew there. Especially on that second episode. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little uneven. <laughs> oh, well. Live and learn. Yeah. Right. Fair enough. All right. Well, enjoy your night, sir. Good talking to you, buddy, as always. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure we'll, we'll chat here. Sounds good, man. All right. Later. Later. Bye. Bye. Thank you.